We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and to Aboriginal elders emerging. Before you fast forward this bit, can I tell you, we'll be attempting another YouTube live stream this weekend, and we'd love for you to hang out and talk true crime with us. This time, we'll be hanging out live from 8pm on Saturday night, because frankly, we've got nowhere else to be. You can find the link on our Facebook page or just go straight to our Australian True Crime Podcast YouTube channel from 8pm on Saturday night to take part in a live stream event where you can chat with us and we can chat back. And it's very cool, so I hope I'll see you there. Okay, Patreon time. Thank you so much to our new patrons. You guys have an exclusive episode coming your way in the next couple of days. It's an interview with a woman who's been a court reporter for many years. She's sat in court during some of Australia's biggest trials. She's witnessed some of the most controversial verdicts and seen some of those really difficult crime scene photos, the ones that the rest of us aren't allowed to see. So how does she keep going? And who are those people who fill up the public seats every day, the ones who call it their hobby? It's a fascinating chat, and that's coming your way shortly. A big shout out to our new patrons, Julie Jeffrey, Marty Halls, Amanda Holmes, Jay Bruner, Jay Bruner, however you say it. I love an initial. I love a person who just goes, just the initial thanks. That's all you need to know. Michelle Condon, Vicky Hipwell, Lauren Wade, Louise Cochran, Logan. I'm giving everything a lot of sugar today, aren't I? Cochran. Logan Hunter, Sarah Bailey, Erin Morgan, Julie Bailey, Jonathan Hapwell, Gail Mathers, Susan Fisher, Donna Curran, Sharon Donovan, Geneva Maxwell and Elizabeth Gardner. Thank you so much for supporting us and to all of our patrons. Okay, on with the show. Please be advised this podcast contains descriptions of graphic violence and is not appropriate for children. I know I'm not the only person still haunted by the photograph of a little blonde girl called Candelise, whose skeleton was found in a suitcase beside the Karunda Highway near Wainaka in South Australia in 2015. I always hear her name in Georgie Coglan's voice because I was working a lot on the project at the time and Georgie had to read the terrible headlines about her identification and the incredible details that followed, night after night. Many of those details were only ever hinted at, but they were still the stuff of nightmares. I vividly remember Georgie cataloguing the things found in the suitcase with Candelisa's tiny skeleton, because they were the kind of things that had been gifted to our own small daughters. A sparkly tutu dress, a Dora the Explorer t-shirt, soft, pink slippers and a distinctive special blanket, the kind that is stitched with love by elderly hands. Simple, normal little things for a simple, normal little girl. How had this happened to her? Who had happened to her? This is Australian True Crime with Michelle Laurie and Emily Webb. What we didn't realise at first was that 1,100 kilometres away and five years earlier in 2010, another skeleton, that of a grown woman, had been found in the notorious Belangelo State Forest in New South Wales. Forensic pathologists weren't able to ascertain much from the remains, but they were able to say that the woman died after serial killer Ivan Milat had been imprisoned for the murders that made the area infamous. So with Ivan off the hook, this skeleton too became a mystery. She was found with a t-shirt bearing the word Angel. And so that was the name she was known by around the Sydney City morgue for the six years she resided there. Carly and Candelisa's family have chosen to stay largely silent throughout the ordeal, from the identification of the remains right through the investigation that reunited them and the judicial process that caged their killer. Probably wisely out of fear of jeopardising the case, and partly, I suspect, because they are normal people, 
and many of the details of this case are frankly depraved beyond response. I don't know exactly what it is they could possibly have said. Journalist Ava Benny Morrison has written a forensic account of the lives and deaths of Carly and Candelise, called The Lost Girls, and in it, she clears up so many of the mysteries surrounding this story. She joins us in this episode of Australian True Crime, and we start our conversation by talking about Carly Pierce Stevenson. Of course, we make so many assumptions about young single mothers, but as Ava tells us, there's so much more to Carly and to her family than a stereotype. We pick up the story during Carly's teenage years. Rebellious, yes, but no more so than mine, or I dare say most of yours. She was living with her mum, Colleen, and her stepfather, Scott. Scott had raised her since she was very young, a toddler. She started to get older and wanted to go out and party with her friends and have a bit more freedom. She started to rebel against Scott's rules as well. So their relationship was up and down in her late teenage years. And it got to a point where Scott and Colleen sort of felt like they couldn't, there was nothing else that they could do. She had been wagging school, which is, you know, sounds pretty minor when we look back on it. And she'd been pinching spare change from her mum's wallet to buy smokes. And it reached a tipping point one day when Carly's high school called Scott and said, look, she's not here again. She's been skipping class. And Scott sat down with Colleen that afternoon and said, what do we do? And he, re- he regrets this looking back, of course, but yeah, he walked into her room and, and gave her a bit of a slap. And, you know, he said to me years later that he, he had never done anything like that and, and it shocked him as much as it shocked her, but he just felt like he was at his wit's end. And Carly ran out of the house in tears and ran ran around the corner to to her grandmother's house. It was all patched up, obviously, and, and they made up, but the relationship was a little bit rocky. Carly ended up moving out of home and she was still really close with her parents. She'd come back over all the time. She spoke to her mum especially multiple times a day, would go around to her office and visit her and hang out with Colleen and her friends as well. Carly started living with her grandmother. And something that we've learned about Carly as well is she loved children. She doted over her younger brother, Luke. She loved holding her baby cousins. And she she just had this uh, attraction to younger kids. And she used to talk about how much she wanted to have a child of her own and, and the kind of life that she would provide for her own son or daughter. She spoke about what it would be like to be a mother. And her family found that really endearing. It was an example of, of the big heart that she had and how she valued family a lot, probably because she came from a big family that was a massive part of her life. And when she was 17, Carly fell pregnant. From what her friends and family have told me, it was a one-night stand type situation and the father wasn't really up for playing the role of dad, but Carly was okay with that. She was over the moon to be having a daughter of her own. Even though she was a little bit apprehensive about telling Scott, Scott remembered the day when he was told the news and Carly sort of took a backward step and left it up to Colleen to tell him. And he said that, you know, he he couldn't possibly be angry when he saw the huge grin on Carly's face. And she ended up giving birth to Candelise in 2006 and she was just completely over the moon. Colleen and Scott were so happy to have a granddaughter and she was just spoilt and doted over and she was just like her mother. She had an endearing cheekiness and loved to be around people as well. They were an incredibly loving family, weren't they? I mean, so we've got Carly who I had to keep reminding myself when I was reading the book was so young still. So she's a 17-year-old mum she really, she's having some, you know, ups and downs with her parents, but we have to remember, as I say, she is 17 and her dad is a stepdad. So they're doing pretty well for a, a stepfather and stepdaughter. She's got her mum, her aunties, her nana close by. She's living with her nan. She has really a couple of close girlfriends. She's close to her younger brother. And when she falls pregnant at 17 and she's not in a relationship, or anything like that, her family is really positive, really happy. You know, it's a pretty nice environment, really. Exactly. They were really supportive and they were over the moon. 
And I think from covering this case, people have drawn their own conclusions and made their own judgments about her and what she must have been like having mm. a child so young. And from, from talking to her family and talking to her friends, they weren't found at conclusions because they were happy with their decision and they were supportive. Sure, it's not an age where most young women would have their first child, but it was what Kylie wanted to do and they supported her wholeheartedly. You know, in her late teens, she did like going out with their friends and she liked drinking, she liked the partying, but that didn't define her and that didn't mean that she was any, she was a bad mother mm. or she wasn't fit for parenthood at all. It was quite the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, and who didn't, uh, you know, at 17. and uh, But overwhelmingly, the feedback is seems to be that she was a great mum. In fact, there was only ever, I think, maybe two people in your book who talked about negative observations of her parenting and both of them were in situations where they may have had reasons for doing that, right? Exactly. Her family said that she was a great mother, that she never would have left Candelise on her own. She never went anywhere without her and she just loved and cared for her unconditionally. And that was the feedback they got from most of the people I spoke to for this book, except for two people. And one of those was Daniel Holden, who told the police that he questioned some of her actions as a mother and that maybe she didn't care for Candelise as she should have and that he knew what he was doing because he'd been around children for most of his adult life. And now, obviously, we know why he would have been saying that because he had his own reasons and he was trying to defend himself, I guess, and, and painting Carly in a bad light would have helped his case in the long run. And there was one other person who was closely connected to Daniel Holden who made a similar observation. She told the police about seeing Carly in a motel room with Candelise and putting her in the shower and leaving her there and not seeming to care whether she was in there or she wasn't. But, you know, you've got to stress that that was at odds with any other evidence or any other information that the police were told about Carly's parenting skills, mm. but particularly because she had, the, she had the support of her family. She left school in grade 10 and she left home around that time too and moved in with her grandmother. And, you know, if it wasn't her grandmother looking after Candelise when Carly was working shifts or hanging out with her friends, then it was Carly's aunties or it was her mum or it was her close family friend as well. You know, yeah, but just, even then her grandmother made such a, a funny, wonderful comment about that that made me think, gosh, they're just such a wonderful down-to-earth family. When a grandmother said, yes, I used to babysit candles at night time when Carly went out, but I still made Carly get up to her in the morning, no matter what time she came home or, you know, if she was hungover or whatever. And I thought, yeah, you see, that's that's the way people share that responsibility. That's sort of the same with me and my mum, to be honest, and I'm 45. You know, that's when, when people don't take care of your child for you, but when a family chips in and all, you know, works together and they give Carly a break and let her be a 17-year-old, but it's not as though she wasn't caring for her own child. Exactly. And especially her grandmother wanted to strike that balance between supporting Carly and, like you said, she was a 17-year-old girl and allowing her to live that life and experience that with reminding her that this was her responsibility. Candelise was her daughter and she had to look after her whether she was hungover or not. Yeah. And that was just an insight, I think, into Carly's grandmother who was this incredibly strong, straight shooter who was a bit of a matriarch in the family actually and, and looked after the grandchildren and her own children and her cousins and aunties quite regularly. And Carly did find a relationship, didn't she, with a man, a really positive relationship with a guy who seemed to love her and Candelise, and it seemed to be a relationship that had a really solid footing. That's right. She had a couple of short-term relationships in her late teenage years. The most serious one was with a local man. His name's Robbie. He lived in Alice Springs, and he told me that he was working at a bar in Alice Springs one night, and Carly caught his eye. And he was running, who's that woman across the dance floor? And then he ended up meeting her at a shopping centre. Some friends introduced the pair. And they hit it off. And he was completely and utterly besotted with her. He loved Candelise as if she was his own. They ended up living together with Carly's grandmother. But it was getting a little bit cramped. And Scott chipped in and said, 
I've got a mate who has a unit at the Speedway. It's usually for the caretaker, but if you guys can look after it and maintain it, then it's yours for some pretty cheap rent. So they ended up moving in there. They were so happy and, and they made it their home. They were having family come over. Carly and Scott's relationship was really good as well. So things were really looking up for Carly and Robbie and certainly Candelise as well. Yeah, you know, it's one of those terrible stories, isn't it? One of those sliding doors moments. They happened to run into this other couple in town, much older couple, but unfortunately they had, the older couple had a small child around about the same age as Candelise. Do you think that that is what created the friendship that they developed with Daniel Holdham and his partner Hazel? I think so. There were certainly some disapproving looks, I guess, or there was some disapproval from Carly's long-term friends and some of her family that got wind that she was hanging out with these new people. Mm. And Daniel Holdham and his then-girlfriend, Hazel Passmore, were new to town. And in a small town like Alice Springs, he'd stick out. And Because Darwin and, gets a lot of blow-ins, doesn't it? But I don't feel like Alice does. Not really, mm. to be honest. It's a big tourist town and a lot of public servants as well. But you wouldn't think it's as transient as a place like Darwin. So... Robbie and Daniel ended up meeting each other and at the time Daniel was dealing drugs and doing drug runs between Adelaide and Alice Springs. But as you mentioned, the similarity between the two couples was that Carly had a young daughter and Hazel had a young daughter and they were around the same age. So they'd go around to Hazel and Daniel's and the parents would talk around the backyard while the kids ran around as well. And that was the similarity at first, but What happened was, you know, Carly said it started to get influenced by what Hazel and Daniel Holden were doing and what they were doing was using drugs. So Carly started getting into that. And from what I've been told, it was only over a pretty short period in 2008 that Carly was using. And at first, you know, she she was smoking a joint here and there and she'd been doing that before she met Daniel and Hazel. But then Daniel was using harder stuff like ice and ecstasy and Carly ended up falling under his his spell. And so it was around about the same time that Daniel and Hazel and her children were involved in the fatal car accident that really just changed everything, right? That's right. And we'll find out exactly how things changed after the break. Coming up on Australian True Crime, we retrace Carly and Candelisa's final journey. But first, the car accident that seems to have set the terrible chain of events in motion. In September 2008, Daniel and Hazel and her three children got in the car and were driving down to Adelaide late at night. And the car rolled and two of Hazel's children were killed instantly and Hazel was left with horrific injuries. She was in a coma for two weeks. She had to have one of her legs amputated and she's now in a wheelchair for life as a result of that crash. In an example of how close Robbie, Carly's then boyfriend and Daniel were, Daniel texted him at the hospital saying, can you please wake up? I need you, you know, to come down here. I've been in a horrible car crash. And it wasn't until the next morning that Robbie read that text message and sped off to the Alice Springs Hospital and, and found Daniel there just completely inconsolable. And he found out that the two kids had died and that Hazel was in a really bad way and about to be airlifted down to Adelaide. And it and- was one of those terrible situations too, wasn't it, where Daniel, who was driving, got out of the accident almost unscathed? He did. And he always claimed that the accident happened because he swerved to avoid hitting a kangaroo. But he'd been doing these drug runs from Adelaide to Alice Spring quite regularly and he was found with a lot of cash in the car. So the police suspected that he was doing a drug run and he was travelling down there to go and pick up some gear and then bring it back to Alice Springs and sell it. As well, he ended up getting charged for that because he was driving under the influence and he had traces of drugs in his system. He admitted that he had taken drugs about three days before at a friend's party, but he claimed he wasn't affected by it when he was driving, but that didn't stop the police laying charges. Did that change his personality? I know he was always a strange guy, but did that escalate his antisocial behaviour? Do you think that accident? It did on his account. And to be honest, it's hard to imagine that anyone wouldn't be very, very 
impacted by something as traumatic as that. And he said, and certainly a psychologist have backed this up, that he was crippled with post-traumatic stress disorder. He had anxiety. He couldn't sleep. He constantly had nightmares. He had flashbacks and he was just completely riddled with guilt. And he started using drugs more heavily as well to try and cope with that. And he talks about in his police interview just the amount of drugs he was having constantly, like not sleeping for days on end, mixing ice with ecstasy, with cannabis, with anything that he could possibly get his hands on because he didn't want to deal with essentially what he had done, killed two of his children in a car accident and left his girlfriend disabled for life. Because certainly he recorded his first conviction for sexual assault of a child after that. Is there any evidence to suggest that he had assaulted children sexually before the accident? Well, this is sort of one of those ambiguous areas in this case because years later, as police are investigating this this double murder, they uncovered some material that suggested that Holden was interested in child sexual assault and child abuse material with Hazel Passmore. Sorry, what police found out was that Hazel and Holden used to write each other fantasies and they were detailing someone's actual recollection of being sexually assaulted as a child and fanciful fiction stories as well along those lines. So that was really disturbing and that suggested that Holden had those interests and was engaging in that sort of sexual fantasy from you know a long time before he met Carly. Okay. So we do know that shortly after the accident, he and Carly, I guess, went public, would that be fair to say, as a couple in that they arrived at the Adelaide Hospital to visit Hazel together or certainly they arrived in Adelaide together while Hazel was still in hospital, right, after the accident? That's right. It was public in the sense that Carly had told her family that she was leaving town with this bloke. And she'd left Robbie, the boyfriend. Exactly. So while Hazel was in hospital and just after the crash, Carly and Robbie were having troubles already. The relationship was a bit rocky. They'd been having a few arguments. Robbie got the sense that she wanted to leave Alice Springs and she wanted to see the world and she was a bit sick of the small town. She wanted to see what else was out there. And it was after the accident that Carly called it quits with Robbie, packed her stuff up and moved out. And Robbie was heartbroken, of course. And then she ended up becoming closer with Daniel Holder. And from talking to her family, we know that she took Daniel Holder over to her mother's house with Candelise. And the whole situation just rang alarm bells. Her mother felt really uneasy around him. She didn't trust him. He was quiet, reserved, wouldn't make eye contact. He seemed disinterested, like he wanted to get out of there. How old Um, was he by that stage? He was in his mid-30s. So he looked he older, didn't he? He was. He did. Yeah. He did. He looked a lot older and, you know, her mother thought, God, this guy looks as old as Carly's stepfather. Mm. What, what's she doing with him? And she even asked Carly, why don't you just go with Daniel and go on this trip with him and leave me with Candelise mm. and I'll look after her because she just – There was something niggling at her and she had these suspicions and she was trying to get Candelise out of harm's way, I guess. And that feeling was reciprocated by one of Carly's aunties who met Daniel when Carly passed through Port Augusta and Carly's grandmother as well. And they just didn't like him. So the whole family was talking to each other, just going, who is this guy? What's she doing with him? And Carly didn't seem like herself either. You know, normally she's, she was really bubbly and vivacious and she loved being around her family and she was really social, but she was quite withdrawn when she went to her family's place with Daniel. And again, I have to, you know, remind um, myself, she's so young. She was 20 by this day. 20. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Because she was so close with her family and spent so much time with them, these changes were immediately noticeable and everyone knew that something wasn't right at all. But Carly was stubborn and she was determined. She went, no, I'm going, I'm leaving, I have to do this. Mm. So she goes in her car with Daniel and Candelise and leaves and they go down to Adelaide where Hazel is in hospital. And Hazel wakes up from a coma in Adelaide Hospital and finds out that Carly is in town and staying with Holden at his motel. And she's livid. I guess Hazel came out of a coma and found out initially that her two children had died in the accident, right? That's right. She and, woke up yeah. after two and a half weeks and the doctors had to tell her 
that her two children had passed away in the accident and she was just distraught. You can't even imagine what that would be like. Yeah. And then finds out that Carly's in town with her partner, Daniel. Yes. And then she finds out that Carly and Candelise have come down from Alice Springs to Adelaide and they're staying with Daniel. And Daniel's tried to reassure her saying, it's not what it looks like. She's down here to see you. She's your friend. There's nothing to be worried about. But Hazel was really suspicious and she was angry too. And she was accusing Daniel of all kinds of things. And that suspicion did not go away. Fair enough. And eventually, I mean, Daniel just left town, right? He just he just left Hazel and he left with Carly. Exactly. It was the day after Hazel's children's funeral. So her two children are being buried. There's balloons being released up into the sky. Hazel is just beside herself, completely consumed by grief. And it was the day after that Daniel just disappeared. She told police that he left a wad of cash under her pillow and wrote her a text message claiming that he had to get out of town because police were coming after him. And she cottoned on pretty quickly that Carly's car had gone from the motel, so Carly was probably with him. And you can imagine what her reaction was. She was abusing him, abusing Carly, sending really nasty text messages. Holden was trying to say, I'm not doing anything wrong here. It's not what it looks like. Again, trying to paint the image that they were just friends and they needed to leave. And and Carly was someone for him to confine in and a shoulder for him to cry on, which wasn't the case. By the time they got to the ACT, their relationship was, while it was short term, it was well and truly on. So what's the last known sighting of Carly alive? Daniel and Carly went to stay at Daniel's cousin's house in Canberra and the last time we know of that Carly was seen alive was after Carly and Daniel had a fight one night and they've jumped in her car and they've taken off and driven to the Blanglow State Forest. The forest is about one and a half, two hours drive from Canberra and just south of Sydney. Something has happened in that forest and we don't know the exact detail of it because Daniel's never been truthful about why he committed these murders. But we do know that Daniel has murdered Carly there. He's taken photographs of her body and done some very, very horrible things to her body, completely robbed her of her dignity. And then he's gotten back in her car and driven back to Canberra and turned up without her. And he started making plans to leave Canberra with Candelise, who of course was left in Canberra with his family. He traded in Carly's car. He actually got his cousin to do it, which got him in strife years later. Got rid of Carly's car, got another car, and has put Candelise in the back of it, told his family, I'm going to Adelaide to drop off Candelise at her grandmother's house. I'll see you later. But that certainly wasn't what happened. And it was only through tracking his phone movements years later and his bank and credit card statements that police were able to draw a map of his journey from Canberra through southwest New South Wales and onto Adelaide. And they figured out by retracing that journey that he has stopped a couple of places along the way and then he's gone to a Woolworths in Wagga Wagga and picked up a few items that in another context look harmless enough, but in this context were chilling. He's got some Chuck's wipes, some garbage bags and some hand sanitizer. And then he's gone to a motel in Narandra and checked in with Candelise and himself for about no longer than two, three hours. And it was years later that police were able to recover the handwritten check-in note where Holdem had confirmed that he had gone into that motel with one child. And that was a massive moment for the police investigation because they knew that Candelise was killed sometime on that journey, but they didn't know exactly where. And that was the last sign of her alive because when they've left that motel, Daniel has started driving to Adelaide and he's got Candelise's body in a suitcase in the back and he's just discarded it like it was rubbish on the side of a highway in the middle of absolutely nowhere in South Australia and kept driving and he's driven straight to Hazel Passmore's house. He's 
estranged girlfriend and he's turned up without Candelise and she's never ever seen again. And by this point, Hazel is out of hospital. She'd been in a coma for a couple of weeks and then she was undergoing some pretty heavy treatment and rehabilitation and she's ended up getting a place of her own. And there was a really disturbing mention in these court documents that I ended up flicking through that Hazel knew Holden was coming back to her. He knew that he was driving from the ACT and that he wanted to rekindle our relationship. Of course, she didn't know that Candelise was with him and that he was going to murder her at the time, but she was excited almost that he was coming back and went to the supermarket and bought food for dinner and made him dinner and set the table and basically waited up for him to arrive home. And he was roughly two or three hours later than she'd expected him. That's right. He, and he walked in and he was quite agitated. He was tired. He was a bit angry and he just wanted to go to bed. And he went to bed but woke up as if nothing had happened. When she finally was being interviewed by police and they commented on how forthcoming she was actually and they were, they were shocked. She talked about how his coming back into her life at least represented normality to her. She knew it was wrong and she knew that it was crazy to take him back, but she just felt, gosh, at least it's it's some of life getting back to normal after this horrible period of time. Exactly. And I think if we are going to explain and talk about why Hazel Passmore did the things that she did, we need to look at her state of mind at the time. She had just been in a horrific car crash. She was disabled. She felt very, very vulnerable. She'd lost her independence. And the man that she was completely infatuated with and thought was the bee's knees had left her. She's at home in this house, uh, essentially living by herself. And she finds out that Holdem's coming back to her. She's torn between being really, really angry at him for leaving her for another woman for a few weeks and just wanting to be loved and having someone that would support her and be with her. And mind you, at this point, she actually started a personal injury lawsuit against Holdman to sue him for the pain and the loss caused to her because of that car accident. And she told Holdman that. And all of a sudden, he's decided, oh, let's get back together. We can we can work through this. I want to come back and see you. And so when he's walked through the door, of course, there's a little bit of animosity there. But I think deep down... She was willing to put that aside if she had someone that was going to love her and stand by her and just be with her because I don't think she felt like she was going to get that after what had happened. And as well coupled with the hatred she had for Carly, from the statements that she's given to police, it's clear that she had this deep-rooted disdain for Carly. She would compare her own daughter with Candelise, she made comments about how Candelise always had the newest clothes and the nicest dresses and this um, beautiful, shiny blonde hair, whereas her daughter had hand-me-downs being the youngest of three children. She had a problem pulling her own hair out, so they had to cut it really short. And there was proof that she would constantly compare herself to Carly and the kind of woman that she was. And, and you could tell that jealousy um, just from reading the police interviews. And she even made a comment that, she did the things she did because she wanted Carly to suffer like she had. There's certainly compelling evidence to suggest that Hazel knew that Daniel Holdham had murdered Carly. And I won't go into it because I want everyone to buy the book um, because it's so detailed, your book. It's really incredible. And there's so much detail in this case. How is it, though, that Hazel Passmore is not in jail? She ended up spilling all this information to the police and that was only under the proviso that she couldn't be charged on the information that she was giving. So she provided an induced statement in November 2015 and any information that she gave during that interview couldn't be used to build a case against her and that was only why she recounted all of this and spoke about the confessions that Daniel Holdham had made to her. But that didn't stop the police outside of the investigation trying to find evidence to charge her because we know that she was also involved in taking money from Carly's account and pretending to be Carly to get some Centrelink payments as well after she died. But so far, no charges have been laid. 
That's right. We know she's living up in Queensland now and she's moved from South Australia. Has she changed her name or anything like that? No, no. She still has the same name. She's had some more children with a new partner who she's been with for, for a few years now. The other thing about the case is that Carly and Candelise were not reported missing. Last week on the show, we talked about the Snowtown murders and about the fact that so many of those victims weren't reported missing. But this is a different twist on that scenario, isn't it? Because the reason that Carly wasn't missing is because her family just so believed that she was still alive and she was out there. It's not that they weren't looking for her, right? Exactly. And a lot of people ask that question when it all came out that Carly and Candelise were last seen in 2008 and they were only being identified as murder victims in 2015. Everyone was asking, well, where did their family and friends think they were? Mm. Why were they reported missing? Was no one looking for them? What's going on here? But the truth was their family thought that they were still alive and to some people that Carly didn't really want anything to do with them. That's only because Daniel Holden was using Carly's phone for years after the murders to text her mother, her aunties, her cousins, even her ex-boyfriend Robbie saying that she was in these different locations. There was one occasion where Robbie received a text message from Carly saying, I'm in Tennant Creek, I need money to buy a candle as a present for her birthday. And Robbie transferred the money, uh, no questions asked. Carly's mother as well had transferred money after receiving messages from Carly saying that she wanted to come home and she needed to fix her car or she needed to get a plane ticket. Her mum at the time was undergoing treatment for breast cancer and she sometimes it was the last bit of money that they had left and she would transfer it anyway because she just wanted to see her daughter so badly. Coupled with this was the fact that Holden was also using Carly's bank account. He had her bank card and he was withdrawing money from her account. This included her her Centrelink payments, her single parent payments and the money that he managed to coerce from her family members as well. So and all the that- things that we read about usually when, when police say, well, they haven't accessed their bank accounts, they haven't used their phone, you know, when they're worried that someone has died, all of those things were happening. Exactly. And that's one of the key proof of life checks that police perform when they are investigating a missing persons report. Carly's mother in 2009 was a little bit worried that she hadn't heard from Carly as much as she usually did. And she actually went to Alice Springs Police and put in a missing persons report about her. And the police there called Daniel Holdham because Carly's mum had said that she left town with him. And they asked Where's Carly? Have you seen her lately? Holden manufactured this story that Carly was in Queensland um, with some man that she met. And police as well ended up contacting Daniel Holden's relative who Carly had been staying with in Canberra, who claimed for some reason that he dropped her at a bus stop in the ACT in 2008. That was the last that he'd heard from her as well. And police checked her bank account and saw that she had been using it or it looked like she had been using it and there'd also been messages to her mother as well. But what they didn't do, and this is a mistake looking back, is they didn't physically cite Carly before the missing persons report was closed. They relied on a mix of this evidence essentially. Mm -hmm. So the accessing the bank accounts, the text messages as well. And on the police version of events, they said that they closed the report because Carly's mother received a phone call from Carly saying, I'm okay. Carly's family's version of events, it was the police that closed the investigation because they said, oh, we spoke to her on the phone. She's fine, but she just doesn't want to talk to you. Neither side agrees on what happened or why the report closed. So we don't really know. But having spoken with police that I know, you know, if that happened today, you would never close an investigation without physically citing the person. Yeah, it's eerily similar to the case from The the Lady Vanishes, the, the podcast. Mm. I don't know if you've been listening to that, but very similar situation. They never actually cited the lady, but they closed the missing persons investigation based on those sorts of, of things. So. Before we wrap it up, also in your book, the detail about the police investigation is incredible. The luck, the things that were still found so many years after the crimes were committed are mind blowing. But I wanted to ask you about the decision you made to go into detail about Candelisa's death. I remember at the time when it, the story first broke, there were certain details 
that were alluded to, certain things that made it out into the media. I remember the mention of duct tape, for example, and things that sort of filtered into my imagination that made me think, my God, what on earth? And you have made the decision to go into a bit of detail in as much as you talk about Hazel's police interview in which she describes what was described to her by Holdem. And I wanted to know how much thought you put into making that decision. Was that a really easy decision for you to make or was there a lot of back and forth? I was pretty firm on including all the details I had about this case in this book. And there is no doubt that this is a horrific, gruesome crime. We're talking about the murder of a young mother taking photos of her half-naked body, doing horrible things to her, and then killing her young daughter. And there is a suggestion that there was an attempt to sexually assault her before she died. And in Hazel Passmore's interview, she goes into detail about that. I did have a discussion with the publisher about including those details because they are distressing and they are very confronting and they certainly made me feel ill when I first heard about them. But I think because this is a book and this will be a record of the entire case that will sit on bookshelves for years, I think it was really important to include every single bit about this case and show in detail the kind of things, the kind of horrific things that this man did and what he was responsible for. And I was asked the question by my publisher, do the family know about this? Are they aware about it? And they were aware of those details and how graphic and horrific they were. They had come out in court before. So I just thought it was really important to include the whole story and and that's why we did have a warning on the first page of the book that some of this material would be distressing. And there's no doubt that it is, but I just really think it was important to have an entire record of the case in this book without censoring anything because the readers would be at a disservice if they didn't know absolutely everything in this case. So Daniel Holdham eventually pled guilty, is that correct? Yes. Late last year, he pled guilty to both counts of murder. It was a real surprise for everyone. He was meant to go to trial and it was a three-month trial Witnesses had taken time off work, flights had been booked, the police were putting the finishing touches on the prosecution case, and then a week before the Supreme Court trial was meant to start, Daniel Holden turns up and decides that he's going to plead guilty to both counts of murder. And the case against him was overwhelming. It was an incredible case with amazing bits of evidence in it, so it's no surprise there. But he, he had a change of mind on the day he was being sentenced, and the court was full. There was family members everywhere. There was a dozen or so detectives, lawyers, journalists. The place was chockers. And he had had a few months since when he first pleaded guilty to be thinking about what was going to come up, what kind of arguments, submissions his his defence team were going to put forward. And on the morning of, he comes up from the cells and he sits in the dock and you can see he brings his lawyer over and the first thing I thought was, "Uh uh-oh, what's going on here? And he decides that he wants to change his guilty plea. Oh, no. And there was just this collective sigh that rippled across the public gallery in the courtroom and you could just sense the frustration Mm. because it was just like he was dragging it on longer than it had to. And uh, fortunately, the judge listened to the argument and heard the application to reverse the plea but dismissed it and then without as so much as drawing a breath just went straight into sentencing Holdem to two terms of life imprisonment. Holdem, of course, has put in a appeal against the severity of his sentence, so we'll have to see what happens with that. Mm. Just even as you were explaining, describing that scenario, it, I felt angry. I felt like he was toying with the court and with everyone in it and with all the family members and that he was trying to get some moment of control back and prove that he was still in control of the situation. Exactly. And and this is a man who had spent almost seven years hiding these murders and harboring this secret and making Carly and Canalisa's family believe that she was still alive. And still texting them. I mean, the cruelty of that is really overwhelming, isn't it? It's so brutal. Exactly. And and one of the most heartbreaking comments that, that I heard during the course of my research was 
Colleen Poe Carly's mother when she was in hospital about to die from breast cancer. One of the last things that she said to her best friend was, please find Carly and Candelise. And that is just an insight into the pain and just the suffering that she went through all because of Daniel Holder. He had just prolonged the suffering, prolonged this grief and the and just the uncertainty of where they were and what had become of them and why they weren't coming home and, you know, what the family had done. They felt guilty that maybe they'd done something that Carly didn't want to come back home to as well. And then that just continued on throughout the court case, especially the committal hearing. He was just pulling out any stop. I left my brief of evidence in jail and then he he was admitted to hospital and he was just doing anything he could to delay it. And then again, you know, on judgment day, he pulls out another card and tries to reverse his his guilty plea. It was just infuriating. Thank you so much for your time. The book is excellent. It's such a really thorough, fantastic body of work and you've done them a great service. Well done. Thank you. Thanks for having me. There are many details left to read in Ava Benny Morrison's excellent book, The Lost Girls, including the shocking details of Hazel Passmore's police interviews. I would urge you to buy this book. Thank you for subscribing to Australian True Crime. We'll be back next week with a new case and a new episode.